People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Check out darkmyths.org to find more podcasts like this and a whole bunch of others that you'll probably think are cool. Darkmyths.org. Check them out on Facebook as well. I think they're called Dark Myths. All right. Also check out our website. Check out the website at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and remember to rate, review, and subscribe to PGTTCM on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This show is also brought to you by bunnyslippers.com and founditemclothing.com. Just to let everyone know, this is a reading episode. Next episode will be a full episode. I believe it is about Blackie. All right. On with uh, Arthur Mackin. Chapter 3 of The Great God Pan by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The City of Resurrections. Herbert, good God, is it possible? Yes, my name's Herbert. I think I know your face, too, but I don't remember your name. My memory is very queer. Don't you recollect Villiers of Wattam? So it is, so it is. I beg your pardon, Villiers. I didn't think I was begging of an old college friend. Good night. My dear fellow, this haste is unnecessary. My rooms are close by, but we won't go there just yet. Suppose we walk up Shaftesbury Avenue a little way. But how in heaven's name have you come to this pass, Herbert? It's a long story, Villiers, and a strange one too, but... You can hear it if you like. Come on, then. Take my arm. You don't seem very strong. The ill-assorted pair moved slowly up Rupert Street, the one in dirty, evil-looking rags, and the other attired in the regulation uniform of a man about town, trim, glossy, and eminently well-to-do. Villiers had emerged from his restaurant after an excellent dinner of many courses, assisted by an ingratiating little flask of Chianti, and in that frame of mind, which was with him almost chronic, had delayed a moment by the door, peering round in the dimly lighted street in search of those mysterious incidents and persons with which the streets of London teem in every quarter and every hour. Villiers prided himself as a practised explorer of such obscure mazes and byways of London life, and in this unprofitable pursuit he displayed an assiduity which was worthy of more serious employment. Thus he stood by the lamppost, surveying the passers-by with undisguised curiosity, and with that gravity known only to the systematic diner, had just enunciated in his mind the formula, London has been called the city of encounters. It is more than that. It is the city of resurrections. When these reflections were suddenly interrupted by a piteous whine at his elbow and a deplorable appeal for alms, he looked around in some irritation, and with a sudden shock found himself confronted with the embodied proof of his somewhat stilted fancies. There, close beside him, his face altered and disfigured by poverty and disgrace, his body barely covered by greasy, ill-fitting rags, stood his old friend Charles Herbert, who had matriculated on the same day as himself, with whom he had been merry and wise for twelve revolving terms. Different occupations and varying interests had interrupted the friendship, and it was six years since Villiers had seen Herbert, and now he looked upon this wreck of a man with grief and dismay, mingled with a certain inquisitiveness as to what dreary chain of circumstances had dragged him down to such a doleful pass. Villiers felt together with compassion all the relish of the amateur in mysteries, and congratulated himself on his leisurely speculations outside the restaurant. They walked on in silence for some time, and more than one passerby stared in astonishment at the unaccustomed spectacle of a well-dressed man with an unmistakable beggar hanging onto his arm, and observing this, Delia led the way to an obscure street in Soho. Here he repeated his question. How on earth has it happened, Herbert? I always understood you would succeed to an excellent position in Dorsetshire. Did your father disinherit you? Surely not. No, Villiers. I came into all the property at my poor father's death. He died a year after I left Oxford. He was a very good father to me, and I mourned his death sincerely enough. 
But you know what young men are. A few months later, I came up to town and went a good deal into society. Of course, I had excellent introductions, and I managed to enjoy myself very much in a harmless sort of way. I played a little, certainly, but never for heavy stakes. And the few bets I made on races brought me in money. Only a few pounds, you know, but enough to pay for cigars and such petty pleasures. It was in my second season that the tide turned. Of course, you have heard of my marriage. No, I never heard anything about it. Yes, I married Villiers. I met a girl, a girl of the most wonderful and most strange beauty, at the house of some people whom I knew. I cannot tell you her age. I never knew it, but so far as I can guess, I should think she must have been about nineteen when I made her acquaintance. My friends had come to know her at Florence. She told them she was an orphan, the child of an English father and an Italian mother, and she charmed them as she charmed me. The first time I saw her was at an evening party. I was standing by the door talking to a friend when, suddenly, above the hum and babble of conversation, I heard a voice which seemed to thrill to my heart. She was singing an Italian song. I was introduced to her that evening, and in three months I married Helen. Villiers, that woman, if I can call her woman, corrupted my soul. The night of the wedding, I found myself sitting in her bedroom in the hotel, listening to her talk. She was sitting up in bed, and I listened to her as she spoke in her beautiful voice, spoke of things which even now I would not dare whisper in the blackest night, though I stood in the midst of a wilderness. You, Villiers, you may think you know life and London, and what goes on day and night in this dreadful city. For all I can say, you may have heard the talk of the vilest. But I tell you, you can have no conception of what I know. Not in your most fantastic, hideous dreams can you have imaged forth the faintest shadow of what I have heard and seen. Yes, seen. I have seen the incredible, such horrors that even I myself sometimes stop in the middle of the street and ask whether it is possible for a man to behold such things and live. In a year, Villiers, I was a ruined man in body and soul. In body and soul. But your property, Herbert, you had land in Dorset. I sold it all: the fields and woods, the dear old house, everything. And the money? She took it all from me. And then left you? Yes. She disappeared one night. I don't know where she went, but I am sure if I saw her again, it would kill me. The rest of my story is of no interest. Sordid misery, that is all. You may think, Villiers, that I have exaggerated and talked for effect, but I have not told you half. I could tell you certain things which would convince you, but you would never know a happy day again. You would pass the rest of your life as I pass mine, a haunted man, a man who has seen hell. Villiers took the unfortunate man to his rooms and gave him a meal. Herbert could eat little and scarcely touch the glass of wine set before him. He sat moody and silent by the fire, and seemed relieved when Villiers sent him away with a small present of money. By the way, Herbert said Villiers as they parted at the door, "What was your wife's name? You said Helen, I think. Helen what? The name she passed under when I met her was Helen Vaughan, but what her real name was, I can't say. I don't think she had a name. No, no." Not in that sense. Only human beings have names, Villiers. I can't say any more. Goodbye. Yes, I will not fail to call if I see any way in which you can help me. Good night. The man went out into the bitter night, and Villiers returned to his fireside. There was something about Herbert which shocked him inexpressibly. Not his poor rags, nor the marks which poverty had set upon his face, but rather an indefinite terror which hung about him like a mist. He had acknowledged that he himself was not devoid of blame. The woman he had avowed had corrupted him body and soul, and Villiers felt that this man, once his friend, had been an actor in scenes evil beyond the power of words. His story needed no confirmation; he himself was the embodied proof of it. Villiers mused curiously over the story he had heard, and wondered whether he had heard both the first and the last of it. No, he thought, certainly not the last. Probably only the beginning, 
A case like this is like a nest of Chinese boxes. You open one after the other and find a quainter workmanship in every box. Most likely poor Herbert is merely one of the outside boxes. There are stranger ones to follow. Villiers could not take his mind away from Herbert and his story, which seemed to grow wilder as the night wore on. The fire seemed to burn low, and the chilly air of the morning crept into the room. Villiers got up with a glance over his shoulder, and shivering slightly, went to bed. A few days later, he saw at his club a gentleman of his acquaintance named Austin, who was famous for his intimate knowledge of London life, both in its tenebrous and luminous phases. Villiers, still full of his encounter in Soho and its consequences, thought Austin might possibly be able to shed some light on Herbert's history, and so after some casual talk, he suddenly put the question, Do you happen to know anything of a man named Herbert? Charles Herbert? Austin turned round sharply and stared at Villiers with some astonishment. Charles Herbert? Weren't you in town three years ago? No, then you have not heard of the Paul Street case. It caused a good deal of sensation at the time. What was the case? Well, a gentleman of a very good position was found dead, stark dead, in the area of a certain house in Paul Street, off Tottenham Court Road. Of course, the police did not make the discovery. If you happen to be sitting up all night and have a light in your window, the constable will ring the bell. But if you happen to be lying dead in somebody's area, you will be left alone. In this instance, as in many others, the alarm was raised by some kind of vagabond. I don't mean a common tramp or a public house loafer, but a gentleman whose business or pleasure or both made him a spectator of the London streets at five o'clock in the morning. This individual was, as he said, going home. It did not appear whence or whither, and had occasion to pass through Paul Street between four and five a.m. Something or other caught his eye at number twenty. He said absurdly enough that the house had the most unpleasant physiognomy he had ever observed. But at any rate, he glanced down the area and was a good deal astonished to see a man lying on the stones, his limbs all huddled together and his face turned up. Our gentleman thought his face looked peculiarly ghastly, and so set off at a run in search of the nearest policeman. The constable was at first inclined to treat the matter lightly, suspecting common drunkenness. However, he came, and after looking at the man's face, changed his tone quickly enough. The early bird, who had picked up this fine worm, was sent off for a doctor, and the policeman rang and knocked at the door, till a slatternly servant girl came down looking more than half asleep. The constable pointed out the contents of the area to the maid, who screamed loudly enough to wake up the street, but she knew nothing of the man, had never seen him at the house, and so forth. Meanwhile, the original discoverer had come back with a medical man, and the next thing was to get into the area. The gate was open, so the whole quartet stumped down the steps. The doctor hardly needed a moment's examination. He said the poor fellow had been dead for several hours, and it was then the case began to get interesting. The dead man had not been robbed, and in one of his pockets were papers identifying him as, well, as a man of good family and means, a favorite in society, and nobody's enemy as far as could be known. I don't give his name, Villiers, because it has nothing to do with the story, and because it's no good raking up these affairs about the dead when there are no relations living. The next curious point was that the medical men couldn't agree as to how he met his death. There were some slight bruises on his shoulders, but they were so slight that it looked as if he had been pushed roughly out of the kitchen door and not thrown over the railings from the street or even dragged down the steps. But there were positively no other marks of violence about him, certainly none that would account for his death. And when they came to the autopsy, there wasn't a trace of poison of any kind. Of course, the police wanted to know all about the people at number 20. And here again, so I have heard from private sources, one or two other very curious points came out. It appears that the occupants of the house were a Mr. and Mrs. Charles Herbert. He was said to be a landed proprietor, though it struck most people that Paul Street was not exactly the place to look for country gentry. As for Mrs. Herbert, nobody seemed to know who or what she was, and between ourselves I fancy the divers after her history found themselves in rather strange waters. Of course they both denied knowing anything about the deceased, and in default of any evidence against them they were discharged but some very odd things came out about them. Though it was between five and six in the morning when the dead man was removed, a large crowd had collected, and several of the neighbors ran to see what was going on. They were pretty free with their comments, by all accounts, and from these it appeared that number 20 was in very bad odor in Paul Street. The detectives tried to trace down these rumors to some solid foundation of fact, but could not get hold of anything. People shook their heads and raised their eyebrows and thought the Herbert's rather queer, 
would rather not be seen going into their house and so on. But there was nothing tangible. The authorities were morally certain the man met his death in some way or another in the house and was thrown out by the kitchen door, but they couldn't prove it. And the absence of any indications of violence or poisoning left them helpless. An odd case, wasn't it? But curiously enough, there's something more that I haven't told you. I happen to know one of the doctors who was consulted as to the cause of death, and some time after the inquest, I met him and asked him about it. Do you really mean to tell me, I said, that you were baffled by the case? That you actually don't know what the man died of? Pardon me, he replied, I know perfectly well what caused death. Blank died of fright, of sheer awful terror. I never saw features so hideously contorted in the entire course of my practice, and I have seen the faces of a whole host of dead. The doctor was usually a cool customer enough, and a certain vehemence in his manner struck me, but I couldn't get anything more out of him. I suppose the Treasury didn't see their way to prosecuting the Herberts for frightening a man to death. At any rate, nothing was done, and the case dropped out of men's minds. Do you happen to know anything of Herbert? Well, replied Villiers, he was an old college friend of mine. You don't say so. Have you ever seen his wife? No, no, I haven't. I have lost sight of Herbert for many years. It's queer, isn't it, parting with a man at the college gate or at Paddington, seeing nothing of him for years, and then finding him pop up his head in such an odd place. But I should like to have seen Mrs. Herbert. People said extraordinary things about her. What sort of things? Well, I hardly know how to tell you. Everyone who saw her at the police court said she was at once the most beautiful woman and the most repulsive they had ever set eyes on. I have spoken to a man who saw her, and I assure you he positively shuddered as he tried to describe the woman, but he couldn't tell why. She seems to have been a sort of enigma, and I expect if that one dead man could have told tales, he would have told some uncommonly queer ones. And there you are again in another puzzle. What could a respectable country gentleman like Mr. Blank, we'll call him that if you don't mind, want in such a very queer house as number 20? It's altogether a very odd case, isn't it? Oh, it is indeed, Austin. An extraordinary case. I didn't think when I asked you about my old friend I should strike on such strange metal. Well, I must be off. Good day. Villiers went away, thinking of his own conceit of the Chinese boxes. Here was quaint workmanship indeed. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Great God Pan by Arthur Mackin this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Discovery in Paul Street A few months after Villiers' meeting with Herbert, Mr. Clark was sitting, as usual, by his after-dinner hearth, resolutely guarding his fancies from wandering in the direction of the Bureau. For more than a week he had succeeded in keeping away from the memoirs, and he cherished hopes of a complete self-reformation. But in spite of his endeavors, he could not hush the wonder and the strange curiosity that the last case he had written down had excited within him. He had put the case, or rather the outline of it, conjecturally to a scientific friend, who shook his head and thought Clark getting queer, and on this particular evening Clark was making an effort to rationalize the story when a sudden knock at the door roused him from his meditations. Mr. Villiers to see you, sir. Dear me, Villiers is very kind of you to look me up. I have not seen you for many months. I should think nearly a year. Come in, come in. And how are you, Villiers? Want any advice about investments? No, thanks. I fancy everything I have in that way is pretty safe. No, Clark. I have really come to consult you about a rather curious matter that has been brought under my notice of late. I am afraid you will think it all rather absurd when I tell my tale. I sometimes think so myself. And that's just what I made up my mind to come to you, as I know you're a practical man. Mr. Villiers was ignorant of the memoirs to prove the existence of the devil. Well, Villiers, I shall be happy to give you my advice, to the best of my ability. What is the nature of the case? Oh, it's an extraordinary thing altogether. You know my ways. I always keep my eyes open in the streets, and in my time I have chanced upon some queer customers and queer cases, too. But this, I think, beats all. I was coming out of a restaurant one nasty winter night about three months ago. I had had a capital dinner and a good bottle of Chianti and I stood for a moment on the pavement, thinking what a mystery there is about London streets and the companies that pass along them. A bottle of red wine encourages these fancies, Clark, and I dare say I should have thought a page of small type, but I was cut short by a beggar who had come behind me, 
and was making the usual appeals. Of course, I looked round, and this beggar turned out to be what was left of an old friend of mine, a man named Herbert. I asked how he had come to such a wretched pass, and he told me. We walked up and down one of those long and dark Soho streets, and there I listened to his story. He said he had married a beautiful girl, some years younger than himself, and as he put it, she had corrupted him body and soul. He wouldn't go into details. He said he dared not. That what he had seen and heard haunted him by night and day. And when I looked in his face, I knew he was speaking the truth. There was something about the man that made me shiver. I don't know why, but it was there. I gave him a little money and sent him away. And I assure you that when he was gone, I gasped for breath. His presence seemed to chill one's blood. Isn't this all just a little fanciful, Villiers? I suppose the poor fellow had made an imprudent marriage and, in plain English, gone to the bad. Well, listen to this. Villiers told Clark the story he had heard from Austin. You see, he concluded, there can be but little doubt that this Mr. Blank, whoever he was, died of sheer terror. He saw something so awful, so terrible, that it cut short his life. And what he saw, he most certainly saw in that house, which, somehow or other, had got a bad name in the neighborhood. I had the curiosity to go and look at the place for myself. It's a saddening kind of street. The houses are old enough to be mean and dreary, but not old enough to be quaint. As far as I can see, most of them are let in lodgings, furnished and unfurnished, and almost every door has three bells to it. Here and there, the ground floors have been made into shops of the commonest kind. It's a dismal street in every way. I found number 20 was to let, and I went to the agents and got the key. Of course, I should have heard nothing of the Herberts in that quarter, but I asked the man, fair and square, how long they had left the house and whether there had been other tenants in the meanwhile. He looked at me queerly for a moment and told me the Herberts had left immediately after the unpleasantness, as he called it, and since then the house had been empty. Mr. Villiers paused for a moment. I have always been rather fond of going over empty houses. There's a sort of fascination about the desolate empty rooms, with the nails sticking in the walls, and the dust thick upon the window sills. But I didn't enjoy going over number 20, Hall Street. I hardly put my foot inside the passage when I noticed a queer, heavy feeling about the air of the house. Of course, all empty houses are stuffy and so forth, but this was something quite different. I can't describe it to you, but it seemed to stop the breath. I went into the front room and the back room and the kitchens downstairs. They were all dirty and dusty enough, as you would expect, but there was something strange about them all. I couldn't define it to you. I only know I felt queer. It was one of the rooms on the first floor, though, that was the worst. It was a largish room, and once on a time, the paper must have been cheerful enough. But when I saw it, paint, paper, and everything were most doleful. But the room was full of horror. I felt my teeth grinding as I put my hand on the door, and when I went in, I thought I should have fallen fainting to the floor. However, I pulled myself together and stood against the end wall, wondering what on earth there could be about the room to make my limbs tremble and my heart beat as if I were at the hour of death. In one corner there was a pile of newspapers littered on the floor, and I began looking at them. They were papers of three or four years ago, some of them half-torn, and some crumpled as if they had been used for packing. I turned the whole pile over, and amongst them I found a curious drawing. I will show it to you presently. But I couldn't stay in the room. I felt it was overpowering me. I was thankful to come out, safe and sound, into the open air. People stared at me as I walked along the street, and one man said I was drunk. I was staggering about from one side of the pavement to the other, and it was as much as I could do to take the key back to the agent and get home. I was in bed for a week suffering from what my doctor called nervous shock and exhaustion. One of those days I was reading the evening paper and happened to notice a paragraph headed Starved to Death. It was the usual style of thing, a model lodging house in Marylebone, a door locked for several days and a dead man in his chair when they broke in. The deceased, said the paragraph, was known as Charles Herbert and is believed to have been once a prosperous country gentleman. His name was familiar to the public three years ago in connection with the mysterious death in Paul Street, Tottenham Court Road, the deceased being the tenant of the house number 20, in the area of which a gentleman of good position was found dead under circumstances not devoid of suspicion. A tragic ending, wasn't it? But after all, if what he told me were true, 
which I'm sure it was, the man's life was all a tragedy, and a tragedy of a stranger sort than they put on the boards. And that is the story, is it? said Clark musingly. Yes, that is the story. Well, really, really, eh? I scarcely know what to say about it. There are no doubt circumstances in the case which seem peculiar. The finding of the dead man in the area of Herbert's house, for instance. And the extraordinary opinion of the physician as to the cause of death. But after all, it is conceivable that the facts may be explained in a straightforward manner. As to your own sensations, when you went to see the house, I would suggest that they were due to a vivid imagination. You must have been brooding in a semi-conscious way over what you had heard. I don't exactly see what more can be said or done in the matter. You evidently think there is a mystery of some kind, but Herbert is dead. Where then do you propose to look? Well, I propose to look for the woman. The woman whom he married. She is the mystery. The two men sat silent by the fireside. Clark secretly congratulating himself on having successfully kept up the character of advocate of the commonplace, and Villiers wrapped in his gloomy fancies. I think I will have a cigarette, he said at last, and put his hand in his pocket to feel for the cigarette case. Ah, he said, starting slightly. I forgot I had something to show you. You remember my saying that I had found a rather curious sketch amongst the pile of old newspapers at the house in Paul Street. Here it is. Villiers drew out a small, thin parcel from his pocket. It was covered with brown paper and secured with string, and the knots were troublesome. In spite of himself, Clark felt inquisitive. He bent forward on his chair as Villiers painfully undid the string and unfolded the outer covering. Inside was a second wrapping of tissue, and Villiers took it off and handed the small piece of paper to Clark without a word. There was dead silence in the room for five minutes or more. The two men sat so still that they could hear the ticking of the tall, old-fashioned clock that stood outside in the hall, and in the mind of one of them the slow monotony of sound woke up a far, far memory. He was looking intently at the small pen and ink sketch of the woman's head. It had evidently been drawn with great care, and by a true artist, for the woman's soul looked out of the eyes, and the lips were parted with a strange smile. Clark gazed still at the face. It brought to his memory one summer evening long ago. He saw again the long, lovely valley, the river winding between the hills, the meadows and the cornfields, the dull red sun, and the cold white mist rising from the water. He heard a voice speaking to him across the waves of many years, and saying, Clark, Mary will see the god Pan. And then he was standing in the grim room beside the doctor, listening to the heavy ticking of the clock, waiting and watching watching the figure lying on the green chair beneath the lamplight. Mary rose up, and he looked into her eyes, and his heart grew cold within him. Who is this woman? he said at last. His voice was dry and hoarse. That is the woman who Herbert married. Clark looked again at the sketch. It was not Mary after all. There certainly was Mary's face, but there was something else something he had not seen on Mary's features when the white-clad girl entered the laboratory with the doctor, nor at her terrible awakening, nor when she lay grinning on the bed. Whatever it was, the glance that came from those eyes, the smile on the full lips, or the expression of the whole face, Clark shuddered before it at his inmost soul, and thought unconsciously of Dr. Phillips' words. The most vivid presentment of evil I have ever seen, he turned the paper over mechanically in his hand and glanced at the back. Good God, Clark, what is the matter? You are as white as death. Billy had started wildly from his chair as Clark fell back with a groan and let the paper drop from his hands. I don't feel very well, Billy. I'm subject to these attacks. Pour me out a little wine. Thanks, that will do. I shall feel better in a few minutes. Villiers picked up the fallen sketch and turned it over as Clark had done. You saw that, he said. That's how I identified it as being a portrait of Herbert's wife, or I should say his widow. How do you feel now? Better, thanks. It was only a passing faintness. I don't think I quite catch your meaning. What did you say enabled you to identify the picture? Well, this word, Helen, was written on the back. Didn't I tell you her name was Helen? Yes. Helen Vaughan. Clark groaned. There could be no shadow of doubt. Now, don't you agree with me, said Villiers, that in the story I have told you tonight, 
and in the part this woman plays in it, there are some very strange points. Yes, Villiers, Clark muttered. It is a strange story indeed. A strange story indeed. You must give me time to think it over. I may be able to help you or I may not. Must you be going now? Well, good night, Villiers, good night. Come and see me in the course of a week. End of chapter four. Thank you for listening to People's Guide to the Two Limitless. This is your host, or one of them at least, Stevie Spitzer. People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is brought to you by founditemclothing.com and bunnyslippers.com. PGTTCM is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Find out more at darkmyths.org and find out more about us at pgttcm.com and pgttcm.podbean.com. Help support the show by donating a buck or five through our PayPal link at pgttcm or buy something at our Amazon link. Look at a small percentage.